from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. This is The Poet and the Poem from the Library of Congress. I'm Grace Cavalieri. We are with the Witter Binner Fellow for 2012. He was chosen by Poet Laureate Philip Levine, and his name is Louis Asikoff. He's here with an opening poem. This is called Dreams of a Work. Waking to wind chimes, I say, this could be China. Then breathing exercises, cold water from the tap, damp matches, black coffee, sun-flecked peaches on a sky-blue plate. Now the ellipse of the day takes shape, its sharp foci, these morning and afternoon walks in to the post office, and in between, dreams of a work worthy of a lifetime, <laughs> to record how, at low tide, the sailboats float in their own reflections, or the way polished stones are turned over and over on the lathe of the waves of the bay. At last, evening's shadow play, and learning to lie so still, my breath barely disturbs the mirror. That is the voice of Louis Asikoff. We're at the Library of Congress. He's published four books of poetry, Dreams of a Work and North Star, Gate of Horn and the verse novella Freedom Hill. The line, dreams of a work worthy of a lifetime. That's a perfect segue for me, Lou. And although we do not have time to read a great section of Freedom Hill, I have to have you tell us what's it about, because I took it on vacation with me, and it rocked the eastern shore. This is the most powerful book, and I want you just to encapsulate what it's about. Well, uh, first I have to say that it's, written in my mind in collaboration with an old friend and teacher of mine who I've known for over 50 years, and I've essentially channeled his voice in Freedom Hill. Uh, and uh, over our 50 years of conversation, I've listened to his brilliance and wit and tried to find a way to become his Boswell, as it were. And Freedom Hill channels that voice and that extraordinary mind uh, although I give it a comic turn, part of the comedy being uh, he's talking all the time and I'm listening all the time and not a word gets in edgewise. Uh, and uh, so that's uh, in part what it's about and it follows him through uh, the death of his father, uh, time in New York, in the world of the art world, and then a stroke that deprives him of speech and then slowly he regains it. But the power in the writing is Louis Asikoff, and that's what I want to talk about. Do you know why it is so powerful? Uh, I think it's only because I'm channeling uh, a superior spirit. <laughs> well, guess what? It's who channeled it. The line lengths are very surprising to me because usually you don't get that much intensity from such a long line, mm -hmm. but it's relentless. It is diction, tone, line length, over and over. But most of all, it's the courage. And maybe it's easier to have courage when you have a persona. Well, I certainly, uh, as I've said a little too often, uh, l like Rambo, I'm most myself when I'm another. Uh, so that I, I think that there are parts of me that probably surface in the poem, but mostly I'm beholden to the mind, the cadence, and the story of, uh, of my friend and master, Bill Wilson. Uh, well, we'll be hearing a little from Freedom mm -hmm. Hill later on in the show, but right now we'd like them to know that Lou Asikoff is the 2012 Witter Binner Fellow, chosen by Philip Levine, the 18th Poet Laureate of the United States. And so let's have another poem. All right, this uh, poetry for me is an act of supreme attention like prayer, and uh, this is a poem that is a kind of prayer. 
uh, it's written in that dark night, uh, and it's written with a f- with a, another friend in mind, uh, going through one of those dark and difficult nights. It's called the Night Fireman. Sometimes, looking up from the page, he finds it difficult not to believe this is the final joke life has played. Like a man shoveling sparks in an iron field, he waits for the wire that darkly sings. Brother, we are celebrating skin cancer in Salem. Please bring uranium roses home from the sun. Mm. That other world where it is written in the book of days, the lost bride returns, wound in her veil of prodigal flame, and all those who praise the kingdom of the mad and the kingdom of God shall be one. Lou Asikoff. He was born in Boston, Massachusetts, and grew up on the grounds of two mental hospitals, (laughs) Danvers State and Metropolitan State, where his father was a resident psychiatrist. How was that, Lou? How did that affect you? Well, two mental hospitals make it sound like I was particularly in need of help. Uh, But uh, yes, I I grew up there, and uh, the irony of it was that because we lived on the grounds of the mental hospital, Uh, Along with a house that was provided, help was provided. So we had an upstairs and downstairs maid and a gardener, all unfortunately certifiably mad. Uh, And in those days, mental hospitals uh, warehoused two to 3,000 patients, and they worked like a feudal estate. They farmed the land. They raised animals. they, uh, They churned the butter, the ice cream, the milk. Uh, they laundered the clothes, and they were paid in script and canteen. Well, this uh, was the 30s and 40s. This was the this was into the into the 50s until uh, until the invention of psychotropic drugs and things like Thorazine, what they called at the time chemical straitjackets, which allowed them to be these people to be returned to the community. And when there was a change in the idea of mental health, it seemed like it was exploitation to make people work for so little pay, uh, but the alternative, returning them to communities, uh, has not worked out very well either, as our homeless population tells us. But Lou, what interests me the most is that you had to recognize a lot of pain very early on. Well, I certainly recognize that what passed for sanity and what passed for madness uh, were not all that far apart, uh, and I was tolerant of certain kind of apparent psychological excesses, and I think it does show up in the poetry in that I'm I'm interested in people who seem eccentric or on the edges of uh, the compact that passes for sanity. There's also a lot of faith in your writing. I think that uh, there probably is. I'm not traditionally religious, but I have a deep and abiding faith that Uh, Human beings are not the beginning and end of anything. It's there, but also I think there is a lot of pain within um, cultural history, within popular culture, all the things you write about, philosophy, and it is about reconciling um, this compassion I bet you got in touch with as a young kid. Well, let's go Mm -hmm. on with your poetry. Lou Asikoff, I'm Grace Cavalieri. We're at the Library of Congress. I'll read another short poem, which is called joy, and it's a father looking at his child, joy. When you showed me the yellow bowl fired with raku glaze, it seemed too somber somehow for a child of 14 to have made. As you lifted it to the light, I could feel the growing desire coming through you in flashes to smash it, shatter that fragile beauty, the pleasure it gave me. Let's have another. All right, I'll, uh, these seem like, I, I'm a generally not a door person, but some of these are quite, uh, seem somber. I'll read one called Hangman, which is, uh, it's a meditation on evil, uh, monstrous evil, which seems to me not that far from any of us. So uh, it's a poem that was had in mind, uh, commandant of German concentration camps, 
although it's a fictional figure, but it draws on uh, Hermann Hess and other, I mean, uh, Rudolf Hess and others, uh, but it's a fictional figure, Hangman, and it's in his voice. My wife's garden was a paradise of flowers. All the prisoners loved it. Gold trumpet of daffodils, lilies, white fire, antediluvian blue of morning glories opening on the vine, and those glowing black lions, the sunflowers, their beards of bees. The promise of bulbs in the cellar got us through winter. During lengthening twilight, Sheep gut vibrated from the harp in my hands. Sometimes, late at night, when the whole earth seemed to me a vast altar upon which is sacrificed all that is living, I would seek relief in the stable among my beloved animals. Mounting my horse, I would whip him round and round the ring, trying to get the terrible pictures out of my head. I was ashamed of my uniform. One evening, I stood at the gate, watching our servant girl fold laundry from the line, when a voice in the wind called out my name. I looked up. No one was there. Yet I had heard it clearly, distinctly, a woman's voice, soft, undulant, haunting, diaphanous almost, the sheerest fabric shaken by the wind, and a shiver went through me as when blood calls to blood its blue tattoo. <laughs> it was the hour between the dog and the wolf. Light trembled. The great bell of heaven dipped and swelled. Beyond the compass of the swallow's wing, I could see slowly unraveling ropes of smoke, the silver quiver of poplars beside the tracks, and the words came to me, a dying man hammers the wings of angels, and I was for a moment lost and afraid. Icy tingling rippled through me, the chill penumbra of, how say it, unfeelings feeling, as though there flowed through phantom fingers a skein of shock silk like woven water, a stocking of skin stripped from the bone, and a dark call C-A-U-L, fell over me, and I dropped into bottomless darkness, darkness of night without measure, night without end, night with its mud and its mared, hiss of gases, howls of terror, cries of pain, night with its crackling black fires and river of worms, night where no one is more sinned against than the unborn, the forgotten, where no brother buries his brother in the ashes and cinders of the field, and the victor, sharpening his sword, strikes stars from stones. Lou Asikoff, how you deal with pain and evil, would you say that you were addicted to irony, and that irony was maybe a good sa safeguard? In your uh, writing? I think I'm aware of the potential of evil in all of us mm. and pain in all of us. So I, do, I don't know that it's irony. Irony, at times I'm ironic, but I, uh, I, uh, am, I distrust easy irony that doesn't include the ironist. In, uh, the, it's, as Kierkegaard reminds us, irony is a two-edged sword. Uh, and, uh, and it cuts the user as well as the one it's used on. Thank you, because that brings another facet of your person, and that is that you have a consummate knowledge of philosophy. And that shows up, I think. And, and would you want to say a word about the poet as philosopher? I mean, most good poets really are philosophers. Well, I'm not sure. Uh, I think Wallace Stevens, who's a magnificent poet, is for me at its weakest when he tries uh, to philosophize, but he has a wisdom that I listen to. Uh, I studied philosophy, but I knew I wasn't ph a philosopher. I didn't creatively do it. I, I learned from it, but I knew that it, it wasn't something I could, uh, I could actively do, but it does inform how I think about things. Right, sure. and I was wondering if you could even be more direct about how it informs your poetry. Is it just a, an intention? 
a kind of a spiritual intention that you live with and write from? Well, but I think you it, actually quote philosophers and, and you... Well, I do. So, there, there's sometimes irony. Uh, but uh, uh, I do. I learn, I, learn from, uh, I learn from what others have thought and said. Uh, and that, in that way, I appreciate philosophy. I don't actively pursue it. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's nothing wrong with poetry being thoughtful. That is a wonderful line to segue into another poem. Lewis Askinoff. I'll read a poem from The Gate of Horn. Uh, and uh, in part, it's indebted to Joya Timpanelli, who's a wonderful storyteller. And uh, I once heard her reciting stories. And years later, this poem came to me. But it uses some of the modes of, of generic storytelling. It's called The Widows of Gravesend. It is told, and it is told, and it is told again whispered in the kitchen by women dividing violets, separating beans from stones. There came a man then walking in his father's shoes who heard the three dogs barking by the stream and at the crossroads owned neither by this woman nor that man saw two white horses in a line and said, yes, I am a wanderer in my own land. Who are you anyway? An old crow fallen among gold apples, a man shaving his father's face in the mirror, naked under the white sow of the moon with only the fake book of beauty for feeling you think, what is my life? A dog abandoned at the end of summer, a walk in the rain. I have lived with my body so long, is it not my soul? Sadness tunes the instrument There is a chill on everything. You feel the surge, the violent momentum of emptiness filling immense forms, energy frozen in each cell, the snow plow in a sea of waves, spellbound by starlight. Night, night, sweetest sister, weary river flowing on, who will sing all our tomorrows? Mm. The lucky ones who continue to live, having nothing, Mm. You are a cultural historian, and to read your work is to see the span of history and the good and the bad of us, really. But was there ever a more enlightened time than now, as far as the mind among us, which we'll call consciousness? Well, is now the most enlightened time, or when do you think it was? Well, I, I, I think uh, it's a time when there's more information than there has ever been. Uh, but I think less wisdom and less true knowledge. So people are overwhelmed by an age of information without necessarily understanding how to integrate it. Uh, This generation that two after me is probably the first one that there was a generation that grew up being babysat by machines sitting in front of a TV, then a generation that grew up interacting with machines, whether it was video games or later the computer, Uh, and they're very cognizant of uh, how information is delivered, Uh, but uh, the general complaint that comes again and again is uh, they understand how everything is mediated, but they have no sense of immediacy. They have no sense of what is authentically themselves or not. It's not a new complaint. You can find it in Lucretius, but I think it's, it's arrived in a new way. So I'm not sure we're so enlightened. I think never have so many known so much and yet been able to do so little about it. I'm glad I asked that. Let's have another poem. Lou Asikoff. Well, I'll read. Uh, these are all a little a little grim, but I... <laughs> what Perhaps can I? in your mind, but you know, we're floating on the words, and I'm still with blue tattoo myself. Well... Wherever you got blue tattoo yeah. was God-given. Well, certainly, uh, as any poet knows, anything good doesn't come from oneself. That's why they uh, invented the muse. It comes from something better than oneself. Uh, Well, I'll read the poem, The Conquerors, which was written uh, on the eve of the second invasion of Iraq. And uh, it's set in a timeless time, but uh, it certainly I was thinking about what happens when 
highly developed technological civilizations make war on uh, on less uh, less advanced civilizations. In this case, one that happens to be the cradle of uh, the the Judeo Christian tradition. Uh, so uh, I had that in mind, and I had in mind. Uh, especially after 2001. My great fear was less the terrorists without than the terrorist state within us and how that's been established now. We live in fear, uh, and the fear is really of ourselves. Marianne Moore said there never was a war that was not inward, and I think we're suffering from that now. And it continues to be generated for us. Absolutely. Too many people, uh, too many people survive uh, in the light of it. And so uh, uh, when the wall fell in 1989, I wrote a little time capsule note to myself. I said, capitalism has triumphed at last and Marx will be vindicated. And unfortunately, that's what we see. We have wolfish capitalism wherever I look. And uh, both the people in uh, Occupy Wall Street and the people in the Tea Party are aware that uh, they are not in control of their lives. That's why we have teachers. Well. Louis Asikoff. All right, the poem is The Conquerors. They showed us the white flower of surrender. They showed us the red. They fell down before us at the gates of their city. Terrible to behold, we hovered above them, lords of the air. We promised them the peace that passeth all understanding. We promise them the freedom of the broken knee only the conquered can know. Rumors arose, strange premonitions, a talking fish, a white crow, and news of uprisings in the distant provinces. Trouble closer to home. Victims killing victims, a priest cried. Who is blameless? The lords of the air, who dare not touch earth, those who kill without risking death. Mm. Following the itinerary of stars, we returned to our city. There we found they had raised in our absence at the center of the great walled marketplace a statue of Phobos, god of fear. As they fell down before us, perhaps we can be forgiven for asking Having lived so long among strangers, what is there to fear? He attended Bowdoin College, Trinity College in Dublin, and Brandeis University, and taught for 42 years at Brooklyn College, where he was coordinator of the MFA Poetry Program and faculty associate of the Wolf Institute for the Humanities. He lives in Claremont, New York, with his wife, the printmaker, Mary Louise Kalin. Teaching. 40 years. You have a character in your book which might be autobiographical, which says, the only thing I regret is once giving a, all the people in my class a B. Was that you? It wasn't me, but it could have been, because uh, when I first uh, taught at Brooklyn College, I taught adults at night, and the first class I taught, I gave 15 Fs out of 23 students because they weren't doing what in my mind was college level work. And one of the students came up to me afterwards, a wonderful man, twice my size and age at the time, a jazz musician who said, I don't think you understand who you're teaching. And he was right in a deep way. That is uh, not that one lowers one's standards, but one, but a teacher has to has to open the students up and learn to approach them. I don't think I gave 15 Fs uh, in the next 10 years. Uh, so there's a little of that there. Uh, what would you thought. do the same way? What What is the major thing you took away from teaching that you are happy about, happy uh, with yourself about, that you would do the same way again? Well, uh, I don't know. I taught for the first 20 years mostly uh, English classes, sometimes remedial, so-called remedial, and composition and introduction to literature. And the last 20 years, I was mostly teaching in the MFA poetry program at Brooklyn College uh, and, and graduate students in literature. Um, Do you think I you loved did some good? I loved watching. I, don't, I did no harm. 
<laughs> I tried to do no harm. Uh, but in terms of the MFA program, uh, I felt it a duty to follow in the footsteps of uh, wonderful poets who had preceded me there, such as Allen Ginsberg and John Ashbery, and uh, keep alive a an experimental tradition that was also founded in the history of the art of poetry. Uh, I also hoped that the students would learn uh, to become whatever they were as poets. Sounds like you can't uh, do more than that. And that that was my hope. Well, may we move into Freedom Hill? Yes, because. This is a book that is truly an astonishing book, and I would feel remiss if we went away and no one got a taste of it. As we recounted, this was mostly channeled from a great friend and mentor and teacher, and the stroke, therefore, was not yours. But before we go into that, there is something in your work that keeps cropping up no matter who you're channeling, and it is the voice locked inside. And I think what I think this means something very big to you because it comes out to the, with a child who was not able to speak until he was six. Mm -hmm. It comes out with a stroke victim. Just very quickly, what's locked inside of us is is powerful in you, isn't it? I suppose uh, I still much of in the book much of it is. Uh, is still autobiographical details of the speaker I'm channeling, but certainly I think in all of us, uh, without being Wordsworth, I'd say there there is uh, uh, there is true speech and true knowing in us that comes out at moments of extremity or when the veneer of civilization is peeled away. And you chose what you wrote. So you have to take full responsibility for it. <laughs> I do, I do. <laughs> and so let's hear I'm a little bit. Guilty as charged. Thank you, Grace. <laughs> Louis Asikoff. Uh, so it's a it's a book length novella, and as you said, I tried to find the cadence of a line which both is true to the speech of the person I'm listening to, but also keeps the lines moving so that it can be read. Uh, it's a verse novella, and I I hoped it could be read at one sitting if people. Uh, were interested enough in what they were reading. I read it in one sitting, and it uh, terrified me. There is, a, give us five minutes worth. All right, I will. I, uh, so it's in three parts, uh, three large parts. One is called Freedom Hill, one is called The Opening, and the third part, which I'll read from, is called The Wall. Uh, they're interconnected, and uh, the ending echoes uh, things at the beginning of this third part. The speaker here at the beginning, uh, I'll pause between the sections, but the speaker here at the beginning is in full possession of himself, but by the second section uh, has suffered overnight a stroke. So he begins speaking as he spoke throughout most of the book. A prune Danish in one hand, cigarette in the other, my diet book on the desk, I sit here waiting for World War III. When I first read The Poetics of Space, it filled the whole world. Now it shrunk to a still point, an infinitesimal aside on the work I'm doing. Fuzzy sets, facetious spheres, and the law and lore of excluded middles. Inside the Florida room, it's intoxicating, the warm air, the weather, what brushes up against me. Here, I have memories of water, trees, sky, and the complex relation of my father's illusions which once and continue to set my illusions in motion. Some of my methods and questions are working. To ask of X, what is his, her impasse and the way through impasse? And what gap, emptiness, and way to bridge the gap? A stuttering silence into which I mechanically insert validity where people write form. As satisfactorily as the flight of a flock of geese toward the excitement of its satisfactions. Not the form of flock or of flockings, but the validity of flock. For diversion, I'm reading a sphincterless philosopher on Hegel and Marx. Beautiful quotations, but dull, dull a dray horse. And acres and acres of Ashbury plowing my delirium. 
Like anyone who's toiled in the trenches of use and mention, I'm smart enough to see the limits of my brilliance and have spent a lifetime figuring out the blind spot between G.E. Moore to Bloomsbury. Mm. Which reminds me, your misuse of synchronicity, which I corrected 16 years ago in a letter never mailed to you, should help inspire you to open the cabinet with a left hand of reticence and write me the poem you'd never want me to read. Like my note in your blue book 40 years ago on Hakusai's waves and semicolons in Henry James, <laughs> the daylilies in my article on Matisse were a lesson to you. Assignments against our failings and the gifts we should renounce for those who whistle by the way. Oh, and here is a moral conundrum for you. Mon hypocrite, mon lecteur, can the slave ever truly betray the master? Meanwhile, I have my own rockets to launch into the spaces and voids of metaphysics, Heidegger's peals of stillness. Section 2. In the first light of dawn, I woke from dial main dreams, the black cat starting his slow migration across my face to a numbing headache, a slight estrangement from myself. Half of me lay in bed, while the other half lay just out of reach, extended beyond the plane of feeling. My right side, I soon discovered, was paralyzed. Mm -hmm. My arm, my leg, my hand. I lifted my left to reach for the phone. I did not know I could not speak. Who are these faces that seem to know me, speak my name? In the white world, tell me where I am. Where am I? What to do? If I could just reach through to. Wa. Wa. Wor. Wor. World. Touch is like bread, the blind man said. Today, Anita brought me snapdragons. While others climbed the purple mountain, rugged rascal, ragged red rocks, stutterers on stones, I stayed below, holding on to the hem of her dress, pronouncing the unpronounceable words, practicing blowing the candle out. World, world, my W's, R's, L's, I did not speak till I was six. My first utterance was a complete sentence. I do not think I am alone in that respect. The mouth is a wound, open, close. The possibility of passing through and an impasse. Throw out the words to a world. Everything collapses around you like gorgeous rubble winged rowers of the river of sky. Is this trial and error or search and destroy? I'm training my brain along new pathways a millimeter at a time and dragging the offending leg along for good measure, a wet bag of cement. I placed a sign on my wheelchair, it's not what you think, sang me and my IV as they wheeled me by. A dismembered remembering that misses the vanishing point. Or, as the mathematician replied to the anesthesiologist, how are you feeling? Number, number. I found my concordance for no in Ulysses. Rescue equals kidnap, kidnap equals rescue. Nay, as in no and Winnem's quomophobia, whatever could I have meant? Impetus, impetuous. As Maxwell said, the devil is in the details. Know what they almost left out of the first edition of the OED? The verb to be. How's that for forgetting being? The older I get, the less I can control. 
the demons, and my misunderstandings, and my childhood pain at being misunderstood. When I open up, I'm immense and defenseless, sweetest sleep, seeping slippage, blow the candle out. That is the voice of Louis Asikoff. And this is The Poet and the Poem from the Library of Congress. The program is produced by Forest Woods Media Productions, post-production by Mike Turpin, MET Studios. We wish to thank the Library of Congress for making this program possible. The series is funded by the Witter Binner Foundation for Poetry. Associate producer is Kenneth Flynn. Our engineer is Mike Turpin. I'm Grace Cavalieri. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.